Well, Lorianne, I'm, I've been looking forward, if those are the right words, to this conversation for a while. In the spring of 2018, I helped to lead a call um, for the removal of one of my denominational leaders who had been exposed for, um, for covering up sexual assault, for perpetuating a culture of misogyny toward women for a long, long time. And on the day that his board of trustees, had been, they had been deliberating and they were making a decision about what to do with this leader and whether to remove him or not, um, I was out of town to attend a conference, waiting up most of the night for that decision. And when the decision came, it was a decision to um, allow this leader to retire with a wonderful retirement package. And I was actually uh, walking uh, to in, in this town I was visiting to meet a colleague. And on the way, I stepped into a crosswalk and got hit by a bus. I spent eight days in Vanderbilt Hospital with life-threatening um, injuries. And I didn't know until later that at the very moment I was getting hit by this bus, my mind full of all this anguish over the lack of accountability for this um, leader, the person that I was going to meet at the very minute that I was getting hit by the bus was in a meeting with her boss disclosing her years of sexual abuse and assault um, for the first time. That sounds like spiritual warfare to me. Then as I lay in the hospital, I started getting emails from people I had never heard of, people I didn't know, strangers. Now, of course, I had received some harassment and intimidation because of my role in helping to um, hold this denominational leader to account. And these emails were coming from men I didn't know who were, seemed to me in a taunting way, asking me to hold another man accountable. Um, I thought this was just part of my denominational wars. The man they wanted me to help hold accountable was Ravi. And they told me about Lori Ann's story. Now, I didn't know Ravi other than being the name of a famous evangelist. He meant nothing to me. I didn't know Lori Ann. But in these emails, um, the story that I understood was one in which I didn't believe Lori. She had signed an NDA. I didn't understand NDAs. To me, she looked guilty. And these men were harassing me. I did send their emails along to journalists that I knew. They told me they couldn't find out anything and they couldn't do anything. And um, finally, the men just kind of left me alone. I've said this to Lori, but I want to say it before all of you. Lori, I'm sorry that I didn't believe you. And I want to confess that. And I want to apologize. And I want to ask you to forgive me if you will. You're really easy to forgive. Yeah. Thank you. So I've learned a lot since 2018. <laughs> and I think a lot of us are learning. And I'm so thankful to Lori Ann. I'm thankful to many other survivors. Some of you are out there um, who have taught me so much um, and are teaching the world so much. And that's not even your job to do. You shouldn't have to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but thank you for helping some of us learn. Thank you, Lori Ann. And so I, I want to start, I guess, maybe where I was a few years ago, the things that I didn't understand. What is, um, just some basic definitions, what is clergy sexual abuse? How is it similar to other forms of sexual abuse and how is it different? Okay, well clergy, clergy abuse uh, can operate in three possible ways. Um, one is by financial malfeasance. Uh, I followed some of the work of the late Dr. Anson Shoup, and he did research on clergy, clergy abuse. And he coined the term clerg clerical malfeasance. Clergy being any religious leaders, anybody who operates or represents anybody in the faith. So it could be the treasurer, the secretary, could be the pastor, could be the worship leader, etc. Um, and malfeasance means to do evil and generally in such a fashion that it destroys public trust. So 
clergy abuse can happen in three possible ways. One is financial, and you don't have to dig very deep for seeing a fair bit of that. Uh, the other is sexual in nature, and the third is spiritual abuse. Mm -hmm. And you can't have uh, sexual abuse without spiritual abuse, and you can't have financial abuse without spiritual abuse. You can, however, experience uh, sexual or financial abuse exclusive of each other. And some people are unfortunate enough to experience all three. And so, in what way, what are some of the dynamics that play into this kind of abuse that make it like other, you know, other forms of abuse, maybe outside the church even? All forms of abuse actually carry really similar characteristics. And um, so all abuse obliterates voice, choice, mm. agency, uh, it breaches bodies, it breaches boundaries, it dehumanizes, it denigrates. Um, it, it creates a situation where uh, in high trust relationships you experience a high trust or a breach of betrayal or called betrayal trauma. Um, the difference between clergy abuse, and there are, there are a couple things, but the main difference between clergy abuse and abuse of a trusted other is that it conflates um, abuse with Christ or, or mm. abuse with God. And so it, uh, all abuse, actually, evidence would indicate that all abuse causes a spiritual wound. So you don't have to be abused in a church to experience uh, a spiritual wound. I, I experienced polyvictimization as a child, so I came to the church as an adult um, with a profound spiritual wound. So I, was, I came into clergy abuse with a spiritual wound, but it was profoundly um, widened and deepened by experiencing clerical abuse. And myself uh, and my husband both experienced financial and spiritual abuse, and then mm. Uh, I was a double header, then I eventually experienced clergy sexual abuse and another experience at the same time of spiritual abuse. And so while all abuse creates a profound spiritual wound, when somebody's being abused by somebody who's not a religious leader, there's always uh, a higher power to call upon. And so there's hope. But when you're harmed in the name of hope, then there's no hope indeed. And I know I'm, a, I'm telling not just my story, I'm telling the story of everybody's, everybody in the room has experienced something similar to that. I want to go back to what was the sticking point for me in your situation because I, you know, again, I didn't, there was so little I understood then about NDAs and other forms of settlements and litigations that are used to silence survivors. Can you talk about them um, and explain, you know, what they are, how they work, and how they have become weaponized in um, these kinds of issues? Yeah, so really good question. <laughs> Uh, non-disclosure agreements, I think it's probably common knowledge that non-disclosure agreements are supposed to be used for trade secrets, uh, not for trauma secrets. Anyone? Yeah. Litigation by itself is a traumatic experience. Mm. Uh, Judith Herman in her book, Trauma and Recovery, which uh, is one of my favorite uh, pieces of work, it's a seminal work on trauma. Um, she talks about how going through the, the criminal or the civil justice system really is, a, is both a pathway to, to potential justice, but it's also re-victimizing at the same time. Um, when you go into, a, well, I went into a situation where I was uh, trying to litigate against my oppressor and just that super backfired, just in case anybody didn't notice. Um, and uh, I still in a, in a state of complete devastation, signed a non-disclosure agreement, uh, because there is just, it's a choiceless choice. First of all, you don't want to choose avoid abuse in the first place. And going into um, litigation with somebody who is a very powerful oppressor, who's backed by finances you don't have. Um, in my case, it was a billionaire, so. But it doesn't matter, like it's just, it's, it's, if it's more than you have, it's more, right? Um, and if it's more than you can pay for two, emotionally for two to five more years of litigation, like there's more costs than money, right? I still had kids to raise, and neither my husband nor I were stable. Uh, and so you can't, you can't fight when you're on a balance beam. Mm -hmm. You have to have something underneath of you. And we had absolutely nothing but thin air. 
And so we signed a non-disclosure agreement which was meant to, to protect the offender, not the victim. Uh, and it was at the time something we felt we didn't have any choice in, um, even though, and you know, your accusers later on say, well, you signed a non-disclosure agreement, and didn't you get yourself a little bit of cash? Um, mm. uh, there's just no amount of money that could make up for that level of trauma. I don't think I need to explain that in this room. And um, the other thing that a non-disclosure agreement does, and abuse does the same thing, so it's a, perp it's a perpetration of the oppressor-victim dynamic, or the oppressor-oppressed dynamic. So the oppressor, or the, the abuser, says that their word, you don't. Your word is now. Your very thing that's left, the only thing you got left is saying, oh, this is exactly what happened, uh, is also gone. So it's another way to dehumanize people, is to, it's to make it so that they can't tell their story. And speaker after speaker after speaker has said that giving voice to voiceless things is part of the healing um, process, right? That's part of naming uh, and identifying what you've been through. So non-disclosure agreements are, uh, they're, they're diabolical, and they're an extension of the abuse and oppression that most people experience in the first place. They ought not be. So we, we've heard some sessions about this today, um, but I don't think we can talk about this enough. Um, I want to hear from you, from your firsthand experience. Um, what do you see as some pathways to accountability um, on the part of churches, institutions, uh, pastors, prevention, um, and just addressing um, clergy abuse? I know that's a big question, but it's kind of the heart of it. So what are some, first of all, like accountability? How do we build in or create accountability? Boy, uh... I, can I reframe your question just a little bit? Mm -hmm. so, sure. Uh, I think the question that most, most survivors want to know is how can I hold these buggers accountable? Right? Right? What am I going to do about the situation? Right? What okay. am I supposed to do? Um, if ecclesiastical accountability worked, we wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. If the church held its own to account, this, this conference would not exist. Um, and this church wouldn't be filled with survivors of them. Mm -hmm. uh, we would be healed and we would be restored to the flock instead of shut out of it. Um, this is where all the bad words are going through my head. Um, I, you know, I think on the upside when, we, when this happened to us and, and we're just one of millions if not billions of people that this have, has happened to, um, there wasn't, there's not a lot, there wasn't a lot of avenues for accountability. So I did have a consultation at the time with um, some leaders, and they were rare, in this area, some a psychologist, and we, we sort of talked about what are the options? You can go to the board. Well, that's a joke. Um, there, there's, the board is usually stacked uh, in mm -hmm. support of the offender, or the offender has so much power, the, the board is a bunch full of yes persons, uh, usually men, because... Men only know how to think and speak and talk and lead, and women don't. <laughs> I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Um, you could go to the, the board and you can go to, uh, you could get a lawyer. Uh, you could, at the time, the only people who had listened to uh, clergy abuse survivors were, were survivor bloggers. Mm -hmm. And they, at the time, I mean, they, they were grassroots people. They're still doing what they're doing, but at the time they were considered fringe. And so it's, mm -hmm. it's easy to dismiss um, somebody who you think are on, is on the fringes because, you know, they're... Remember, they're demonizing their, their agents of Satan. I think they were called daughters of Satan, actually, at the time. Um, and so that was an unattractive option. And, uh, and the other option was to do nothing. And that didn't seem like a possibility either. So in the hopes of having some type of privacy, we chose to go with a lawyer. And I think 
the, 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 the final one was also to go to the secular media, to like kapow uh, everything out into the open. And that wasn't something I was willing to do either because uh, you have know this, because I've said from my keyboard, I'm actually an introvert. Uh, and um, this type of central attention isn't comfortable for me, but that doesn't change how history has happened. Um, and also my, my family dynamic was such that it just wouldn't be comfortable to be exposed in that way. And guess what? I was exposed mm. anyway. I was exposed, then silenced. So those are still avenues of, of accountability. Uh, clearly there is, if it's criminal, it should be reported to the police. Um, but so often, uh, even those avenues have difficulty. I, as Dr. McKnight had said earlier, these people really do fear the truth being told. Like they, mm. so, um, so telling the truth in, and finding the best possible way to tell the truth in the manner and way that protects you the most and exposes them the most is whatever that looks like for you. Um, those are just some possible avenues in which to do that. Mm. But the most important part is I'm going to say this, and I'm, I mean it, and it's not, not going to be, I want you to receive it from the heart of somebody who has not just barely survived this. Um, the most important part is not their exposure. The most important part is your safety. when you talked about the lack of um, the churches and institutions holding people accountable, um, it really has been most of the time the journalists who've done, done the job. Um, and I've also found in, you know, because after your, you know, my interaction with your story, I was uh, learned about terrible abuses at my own institution and my own employer, and those were in the headlines for a while, again, through journalists, and I found that, that a, a key defense strategy of these institutions is to blame the liberal media for making up lies and, and being tools of, of Satan. I mean, and that's, that's essentially it, and so many people believe that. Um, so the journalists do some of the best work, and the bloggers. Um, and yet still there is so much denial. Um, but it, in God's timing, the truth does come out. Um, so let me just ask this because we're, we're talking about the denial and the defenses and the silence that is enforced by these documents. Um, what do you do when people lie about you. Anyone else want, want the answer to that question? <laughs> All right, well buckle up. I don't think you're gonna like what I have to say. Most victims are empathic. Right. Most victims want to belong. They want to be part of community. Most victims have some sort of vulnerability. I don't know, like being human. Um, and when you're lied about, when you tell the truth, it's devastating. It's, uh, it's destabilizing. It can be annihilating. It can be lethal. Um, and there's nothing like being globally lied about um, to make you really uncomfortable even sharing your name with people. Um, so here's what I'm gonna tell you. I want you to look at how, I want you to consider looking at, I'm gonna tell you what to do. I want you to consider looking at how did Christ answer his accusers? I don't like it any more than you do by way of answer. If Christ be our model, if he be our king, if he be even a moral teacher that we think is worthy of following, then his example has to mean something. It is absolutely pointless in the face of a tsunami of falsehood to do anything but just quietly 
speak the truth. There is something There's something to bearing the cross and scorning its shame that's stabilizing, believe it or not. And when I, I, I'm not a theologian and maybe Dr. McKnight and other people like that could elucidate what that means, but for me what that means is that you sort of bear the full cup of what, of, of somebody else's wrath when you don't deserve it and do right anyway. And when you know yourself to be true, but everybody else in the globe, including people in your home, think you're false. That the truth is solid on the bottom and it emits its own light. And that when the time is right, the truth and the truth alone will rise up to defend itself. You don't have to. That's about all I have to say about that. There's a reason why they call Jesus the truth. The trouble, with, the trouble with it is that so many people were crucified and told lies in the name of the truth. And so yes. part of this work is actually figuring out what the truth actually is. Mm. And um, that doesn't look anything like what most of us learned it was. Radically different, actually. And I just want to give praise to God and his son, Jesus, for letting the truth of your situation come out, Lorianne. I just give him the praise. Um, you give me hope and inspiration. So this truth coming out, as long as it took, and I know it, well, it was an eternity. It doesn't matter how many months or years, and others have borne the same. But it is a form of justice for the truth to come out. So let's just talk about justice. What does real justice look like in these situations? And then maybe we should talk about mercy too, because we can't talk about one without the other. Small question. How y'all doing? Everybody need a deep breath? <sighs> Oh, thanks. It's like birthing a baby, man. Um, it's hard stuff to talk about. You know. How are you all doing? You okay? Good. Real justice, uh, first of all, justice can come in sort of probably a bunch of different pathways, but I'll name four ecclesiastical uh, pathways. There are those, whether they're working or not is a different thing, but I have heard of some cases where they have, and those have given me hope, and, and those are very beautiful. When ecclesiastical uh, justice uh, works, it really restores um, wounded places in people and restores the sense of trust and faith in the church. So if anybody thinks that that might be a good idea, might want to use their own rules. Criminal justice is an option. Uh, unfortunately, uh, a lot of things that are immoral and profoundly wounding are not yet criminal. So clergy sexual abuse laws are important to enact and people who have a passion and an interest in that type of um, advocacy is, are really important. There are civil pathways for justice and um, I don't need to tell anybody in the room how costly it is to endure abuse. And so any kind of recompense that's possible is, uh, is worthy of pursuit. I would just encourage you to get a trauma-informed lawyer. I won't make any shameless plugs, but <laughs> you know who you are. <laughs> um, and there's also 
and and I again these are this is something I I find difficult to to talk about because I don't want to sound trite and I hope that um, I, if suffering if suffering lends any credibility you can just hear this through the lens of suffering not through the lens of like platitudes what does divine justice look like um, and I don't think it looks absolutely anything like we think it will um, and uh, if you watch closely for divine justice, you will see that people who consume the truth, that then you are truth seekers and truth consumers, otherwise you wouldn't be here. And you actually have the opportunity to ripen and live in the light, even though the light has been called dark, or you know, what has been darkness has been called light, you actually have the opportunity to live in the light. These fuckers don't. And that's what I call them in my head all the time. <laughs> all the time. Um, I would say that uh, the injustice that we experienced wasn't a new experience for me. I was born into a home of a sexual predator. Uh, my father was a, is deceased now, which is a mercy. Um, speaking of mercy. And I do mean that, I, he was miserable. Everybody he was around was miserable. I don't mean that to be trite, it is a mercy, he's gone. Um, and uh, he raped all my sisters and made multiple attempts to do the same thing to me. Um, and he did like nine months in prison for ruining everybody's life. So, so, so tell me there's justice in the criminal justice system and I'll wait. That's Canada, yeah, yeah. But only, um, there's one statistic that says like 3% of sex offenders are ever incarcerated. So, you know, 97% of the rest of the people who even bring that to light, uh, much less the people who don't, uh, don't ever see criminal justice uh, occur. And so here's the thing about justice. Um, and I didn't know any of this when this happened to me, okay? So this is all hard earned, things uh, that have come since, uh, since life fell apart, uh, is that if you're not going to get justice, you better become it. And that alone is a just outcome. You, you can become a just outcome. You don't have to get a just outcome to be just, to become a just outcome. And mercy, let's get to mercy. I don't think mercy looks anything like we think it does either. Mercy is not soft soap and candy floss and popcorn. There is a savageness in mercy. It looks nothing like welcoming an offender back into the fold so he can destroy more sheep. Y'all are so safe to talk to. I really appreciate that. You should never share anything where it's not going to be absorbed well. Don't pour out the beauty of you in environments where it's going to be splashed back in your face. So thank you for being such absorbent listeners. Um, this is hard for me. It's, n it's not something I love to do. But I came because... Julie Royce asked me to because she did something for me and I believe in reciprocity. And um, because I love you. Love you. One more thing I want to talk a little bit about in terms of mercy. Um, I see you on social media where we are too often, <laughs> some of us. You are, I want to talk about two things related to this. You are so merciful to others. The abuse survivor community rightly, justly, understandably, is one filled with 
people in fight or flight mode, people who are hurt and angry and wounded and seeking healing and seeking justice and who need mercy. And I see you as one who is always merciful. To them, to others like me who don't, who have made mistakes and, and don't understand, and also merciful to yourself. So can you just talk about where, how do, where does that come from? How do you do that? How do you sustain that? Karen, that's not on the list of questions. I know. <laughs> Pop quiz. All right. Um, I'm a mom. It's the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, I have children, uh, one of them's grown, and um, I didn't have appropriate development. Uh, that shouldn't shock anybody, um, but they have. And so I've been privileged to be part of their development from you know, infancy, extreme vulnerability, to a toddler that you wanted to throttle but couldn't, <laughs> um, to the adolescent who was awkward and gangly and extremely vulnerable, who didn't know their identity, who, who every move is awkward and uncomfortable to the adult who's becoming and learning to fly on their own. And I have a profound maternal heart. Um, and what's true for my children has to be true for me. Mm -hmm. yeah, it has to be. I have to have the, uh, the I can't leave it an incongruent truth. Probably not again the rest of you, you wouldn't be here. Uh, so if they're allowed to grow and they're allowed to become and they're allowed to make mistakes and they're allowed to not know, and they're allowed to be in a developmental process, if they need comfort, if they need nurture, if they can make mistakes and be forgiven, um, if they can royally screw it up and have to pay the price and just start again, then so can I. Uh, no baby is born a sexual predator. Nobody is. So we become that. And uh, I was talking in a group with a group of clergy sexual abuse survivors, primary and secondary survivors at, a, at the hotel a couple of nights ago. And I said, there's mercy for everybody, you know, including offenders. But hold on. Mercy does not mean trust. Mm. I will tell you that uh, we can never be more fully human by dehumanizing anybody. I don't care who it is. Amen. So you wanna be free? I do too. You're gonna have to use the tactics of liberty, not the tactics of oppression. That does not mean being naive. The Bible says, it talks about, you know, when I was a child, I thought like a child. It's time for some of us to grow that up. Right? And that's a developmental process. Don't be naive, but don't give way to cynicism either. And so that's a process. Right? Part of what, you know, constantly made problems for me was that I was, I thought like a child because I had developmental places where I wasn't grown. So all that to say, how come I'm merciful? Because I see humanity in everybody, including me. Well, as someone who has experienced that mercy from you and that ability that, you know, to experience growth and change because you made room for it, again, thank you. Um, so for those of us, again, I, I um, you know, I, I'm here to, to, hear you and to listen and to learn. That's what I've been doing these past few years. And so for those of us who are in that space, we are learning, we are listening, we want to support. Uh, some may even want to advocate. How can, we, how can we equip and empower survivors rather than, um, which is my sort of natural instinct, um, to kind of just like do it for people, fix it. Um, how can we equip 
and empower rather than try to do it for you. Abuse is done too. So abuse is something that steals voice, choice, agency, personhood. Mm. Um, it's not a decision. I don't care if you wore the wrong dress or you were in the wrong spot or you told your secrets or you, or you trusted him or uh, it doesn't matter. It, you know, what, what decisions you felt you made, abuse is never a choice. And so uh, the pathway out of uh, abuse of any kind is the opposite. And I, you know, Diane Langberg is, Dr. Langberg is, uh, you know, responsible for clarifying and elucidating that in my life with her work. Yeah, you, you can't do the same thing that abuse did. It has to be the opposite. So in recovery, Survivors have to have control. Mm. Um, they have to be heard. And sometimes that means they even just need to be able to hear themselves first. Um, they, um, they need to be somebody, it was Virginia Woolf, she's a, a late author. She actually ended up taking her own life on account of the abuse, sexual abuse that she suffered at the hands of her um, two stepbrothers. And she's a prolific, beautiful author, beautiful woman. And she wrote a, a narrative where she was talking about looking glass shame. Mm. That she, you know, when she looked at herself in the mirror, she felt shame because of the sexual abuse that she had endured. And perhaps some of us can relate to that. And she talks about being someone, being a person to whom things happened. Anybody else identify with that? And part of the recovery process is, is, is becoming a person who makes things happen. If you do for me, then somebody else with less good intentions is also going to do for me and they're gonna to do to me. And I don't know about the rest of you, but uh, I'm okay to be partnered with when I need and want help anymore. But the very best thing that, uh, that I've learned to do is to be able to do for myself, um, if that makes sense, to be able to exercise. It's like a muscle, like, mm -hmm. can I make a decision? I, I, I don't think I've made a full-fledged decision other than marrying my current husband and having my last two children until I was in my 40s. Mm -hmm. Everything else just happened. That's sobering people. That's like halfway through life before you make a decision. Like toddlers make decisions. No. I don't want, like, there was no no in an abusive environment, right? You don't even learn to exercise that muscle of no. Mm -hmm. Much less, it's just yes, in, in, when you're formed and fashioned in abuse. And I do think that Christendom, uh, mm -hmm. I wasn't raised in Christendom. I came to it late in the game. Boy, oh boy. Um, Christendom doesn't help mm -hmm. the development of agency and, and doesn't necessarily help with empowering individuals. Uh, Christ does. Mm -hmm. um, Christendom does not. And I really think that part of, uh, part of the development of process is, is acquiring information and then wisdom is the, uh, the application of that information, that knowledge. And so growing both in information and knowledge or information and wisdom so that you can make informed decisions is really, really important. Mm -hmm. No, that, that's very helpful. Um, I mean, the Messiah complex runs deep in many of us um, and it can be hard for us to resist that urge to want to save other people. Um, There's already, only one savior. I know, yeah. <laughs> amen. So what are some other um, pitfalls that people who want to uh, support for or be advocates for survivors, what are some other pitfalls that we can fall into? To advocate is, the root word of that is, I think it's advocare, uh, it's from the Latin or Old French, and it means to publicly stand up for, to, to defend. It has some, some legal language associated with it. Uh, what it doesn't mean is to, uh, people say, oh, thank you for being uh, a voice for the voiceless. Hold on a second, unless they're mute. Mm -hmm. Anybody? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, advocacy means helping somebody else to find their voice, not 
speaking for them. Mm -hmm. So there's some advocates, uh, self-proclaimed, untrained, that need to drink a cup of shut the up because it's not theirs to say. Mm -hmm. Okay. When you advocate, you lend your power to somebody else, you don't stand in power in front of them. You partner with. To do all other than that is to make them less human and an object of your action and to make them a non-dialogical, inactive, passive individual. And guess what also does that? Abuse. That's it free sermon. Um, I think that we have to deal with our own, uh, our own pain before we, uh, you know, at least the mountains of it and have some level of self-awareness uh, and humility uh, before we uh, come alongside of other people and partner with them uh, or proclaim to have answers. I think that there's an awful lot of people uh, that have, think they have answers when they really should just have questions. I think that we should st probably stop doing so much aid and start doing more abiding. Mm. Mm. And lastly, I would say this, uh, you know, wherever you see tools of oppression being used, manipulation, name calling, deceit, proclamations, in my opinion, if I hear that one more time, <laughs> I don't care about your opinion. I care about yours. I don't care about how you feel, but I don't care about what somebody else's opinion is. I have had enough of somebody else thinking for me. Thank you very much. Just give me the information, and I will think it through myself. Anybody? So let's go back to talking about um, survivors. Um, and again, this is helpful not just for survivors, but for people like me who want to support them. Um, what are the phases of recovery? Judith Herman, uh, again, uh, I have more books than hers, but uh, <laughs> she, in the early days, her work really helped me have a framework because there's, you know, somebody wrote this quote of, um, the map's not the territory, right? So you can have a map, but it doesn't look anything like the road you're on. It just happens to give you some sort of sense of direction. So there's a bit of a map uh, for recovery in that book, and it's evidence-based, and I really like it. And she talks about three phases of recovery that are clearly on a continuum. They're, they, there's no like, okay, I'm on phase one, then phase two, then phase three. They, they intermingle and flow in and out of each other mm -hmm. a bit. The first phase is safety and stability, developing safety and stability in your life. And that means fiscal stability, emotional stability, psychological stability, physical stability. Can you eat? Can you sleep? Can you move? Do you have employment? Do you have safe lodging? Are you physically safe? Are you emotionally safe? So developing and keeping that, uh, and that's primary. And then the next phase that she elucidates is grieving and remembering, and that's where a therapeutic, therapeutic alliance is really important. Uh, and cannot overstress the importance of finding safe therapeutic relationships. Safe therapeutic, a, a pastor is a pastor, not a therapist. And uh, grieving and remembering takes time, and it, uh, you should have somebody licensed by a board that, that you can hold accountable, okay? Not a church board, like a psychological association somewhere, some sort of backup. Uh, somebody registered to do what they're doing, not just certified. Uh, and then the third phase is reintegration. And reintegration involves mm -hmm. going back into um, the things that used to bring you life. And for, uh, I have probably spent two years, two, two, th two, three years in each phase. I'm still heavily in reintegration. This is, re for me, this is reintegration. Like, and I know, I mean, just... I know, know so little about this, and yet um, just being hit by a bus um, and experiencing that kind of trauma and that to you, my mind and body, it, it really, I mean, God has used that to help me understand 
uh, trauma in general, other people's trauma and healing and how it's not linear, right? And so in that way, I just see it as a gift that's helped me open up my eyes and understand all of this more. And so I want to close just kind of on the note of this conference. I just, you know, the, the tagline or theme for this conference is restoring faith in God and the church. And so do you have, do you have a word for us um, on that theme? Like, how can we, how are we, how could we help everyone here just have a little more restoration of faith in God and the church? I heard Rachel Den Hollander say somewhere, like, you know, you don't have faith in Christ or in Christianity, you have faith in, in Christ. And I, I think that for some of us, even that can be a stretch because so much has been um, bound up or called Christ, which is anything but. And one of the last songs that we just sang before you and I came up on stage, there was a line that says, you know, where there has been um, salvation in your name. You know, for many of us, there's been slaughter in his name. Right. And so calling upon the name of Jesus, while it's, it's, it, it's part of the ethos of faith in Christ, can be a painful thing to do. Um, and it, it, that, that song also talked about have being a living hope to me. And I think that uh, it's difficult to have faith when you don't see it in actual action. And I just want to thank you. Um, thank you for showing up in this space. Uh, it's not, you're the experts in the room. You really are. Um, these people have come to serve you and to bless you. I've come to terrified. <laughs> um, and, uh, and to, to be blessed, but I always want to say that you, you're being here. This is a, a church filled with people who have been hurt by the church, and you're, part of your just presence here restores my faith, not only in humanity, but faith in faith itself. Um, and um, Dr. McKnight, in his session, he opened by saying, we believe you. How beautiful it is to be part of the fellowship of finally believed. Thank you.